We are the anchors of Queer News Tonight, and this evening we discuss the queer headlines. The U.S. Supreme Court declined to review an Indiana couple's appeal, challenging the state's removal of their transgender daughter. Book bans in the U.S. soared to a record highs in 2023, with 4,240 books targeted, 47% focusing on LGBTQ plus and radical themes. Challenges surged the most in Florida and Texas. Transgender Day of Visibility, March 31st, celebrates and advocates for transgender rights, recognition, and equality worldwide. We will dive into the importance tonight. Maxwell Poth's latest portraits capture the timeless elegance of the old gays, celebrating their resilience and vitality as they age gracefully. Queer News Tonight is all for it. Eric McCormick discusses straight actors playing gay roles, emphasizing acting's transformative nature. He advocates for casting based on merit. Good evening. Welcome to Queer News Tonight. This is the world's first and only LGBTQ plus daily evening television news broadcasting live and available on demand. Available on all smart televisions, including Roku, Apple TV, Android TV, Amazon Fire TV, Twitch, YouTube, and Facebook. It's time to queer up the news for Wednesday, March 20th, 2024. We are live and literally out of the closet and into the headlines. So many of your important stories we're going to tell this evening on Queer News Tonight. This is the world's first live daily LGBTQ evening news show, literally out of the closet and into the headlines on Queer News Tonight. This is the world's first and only unedited live LGBTQ plus evening news show. Whatever happens unique in LGBTQ plus news, you will see it and hear it. Hotspots Magazine, Hop Hap Happening Out Television Network, is a nonprofit 501c3 media company in the same model of PBS and NPR, but designed for the LGBTQ plus community. Our mission is to support the 11 pillars of the LGBTQ plus community. We want to inform and educate the key issues of our queer culture, black community, Latino, lesbians and queer women, trans, students and youth, seniors, HIV and AIDS healthcare, business, social justice, and faith. Help us support our community. We are part of one of the largest LGBTQ plus and nonprofit media companies in America, Hotspots Magazine and Happening Out Television Network. In 2024, our magazine is celebrating 40 years of the LGBTQ plus experience and our television news, talk and entertainment shows support our mission to educate the LGBTQ plus and broader community. Let's meet tonight's anchors and all of their lovely wigs at Queer News Tonight. Let's first welcome Trinidadi. This artistic talent is a violinist and pianist with the Miami City Ballet and is the program director for the Seminole Theater Players in Homestead. Welcome, Trinidadi. How are you? Hi. <laughs> <laughs> and she loves to talk. Now, Trini, you are a musical artist for Miami City Ballet, and you are going to be doing an extended concert performance of the iconic Swan Lake in Miami, Fort Lauderdale and Palm Beach. Tell me, what's happening? Well, it is not the traditional Swan Lake. Uh, it's new choreography by Alexei Rutmansky, a uh, new up and coming uh, choreographer who's set to be like the next Balanchine. Uh, we premiered, I think, in North America a couple seasons ago, and so now we've brought it back. And uh, if you all know the story, it's about this, you know, black swan uh, uh, impersonating um, somebody much more important. And by the way, where's Faye what? Who cares? <laughs> I did not say that. Let's welcome Edward Otto Delke from a successful career in financial marketing to his current role as the director of marketing and sponsorship for the Gay Men's Chorus of South Florida. Edward's journey is marked by accolades and achievements. The Gay Men's Chorus of South Florida is one of the world's largest and most important LGBTQ plus cultural arts organizations. Edward, this weekend, the Gay Men's Chorus of South Florida goes uber gay in a masterclass for our love of musical films. The show is called Hooray for Hollywood at the Parker, March 22nd. Tell me what's happening. Yeah, I, the, the chorus is doing amazing work. The, the, the concert is this Friday. We've only got maybe about a dozen tickets left. So definitely go on to gmcsf.org and get your tickets.
Um, we're spanning 100 years of movie musical uh, moments. And so that you'll see everything from the sound of music all the way up to Barbie. So it's just going to be a fantastic hey, evening. Hey, better work. Next, let's welcome Mark Pettit. Mark is a pioneering traveler and coordinated the very first gay pride parade ever on the continent of Antarctica. He is also a former Mr. Sawmill Leather Sir. He and his husband Luke run linksbyluke.com, the chainmail harness and pride accessory shop. Mark, you and Luke are going to be at Miami Beach Pride on April 13th and 14th. Tell me, what's happening? We are going to be there, and we are so excited to get to be there in person. We've gone for a few years just to enjoy the the, the crowd, the fun, everything like that. But we're going to be set up with uh, a proper vendor spot on both days, uh, doing all kinds of very custom fit kind of work. So when you have something put on, you know, we feel it all around and make sure it's got the right tension. No, we don't really do all that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just playing. Uh, but yeah, please come on out and, uh, and and see us. We'll be at Miami Pride on both days and would help to make you look just a little bit more proud. Yeah, that sounds so nice, Mary. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, this is tonight's lead anchor, Bonnie Builder. Bonnie is the premier South Florida bodybuilding drag queen and the current reigning Mix Marys. A recent graduate of FIU, she's a trainer and comes to life with a microphone and a spotlight. Bonnie, you've been talking about the HOT beach party at Hallover Beach. Tell me, what's happening? So, first and foremost, I will say that HOT is a social club that's ran through Miami, uh, Fort Lauderdale, basically all of South Florida. And the members are Hector and Jorge. By the way, today is Jorge's birthday. Happy birthday, Jorge, you old bitch. She's finally 30. You can see it in her fucking wrinkles. <laughs> so. This lovely organization is hosting a beach party on March 30th. And based off their website, which is houseoftrouble.org, the space is for anyone to enjoy a day at the beach. We are a community of LGBTQ plus people who love to mingle, dance, and drink. Come say hi, and who knows who you'll meet. They have three passes, a beach pass, supporter pass, and VIP pass. Once again, go to houseoftrouble.org. It's a naked beach party? Of course it is. Okay. Haul over. Just pole and wondering. pole and lots to drink, Fine. including the poles. <laughs> we are the reporters for Queer News Tonight, and this evening we begin with the queer headlines. The LGBTQ plus community in South Florida and across America is diverse. Our community across the world is vast, and here are the bullet points of the queer news for Wednesday, March 20th, 2024. First this evening, let's queer up trans rights. Supreme Court declines Indiana couple's appeal in trans daughter custody case. The U.S. Supreme Court rejected an appeal by an Indiana couple challenging the state's decision to remove their transgender daughter from their care. Mary and Jeremy Cox from Anderson, Indiana, expressed concerns about future conflicts over gender identity. Their daughter was removed in 2021 due to reports of verbal and emotional abuse where Mary Cox, a self-described devout Christian, called her daughter, quote, the bitch that killed my son. The state has cited her parents' response to her gender identity as a contributing factor to her eating disorder. While the court rejected their appeal, emphasizing the importance of the teenager's well-being, it also ordered family and therapy for all parties involved. Mary Cox had previously withdrawn her daughter from school and discontinued therapy for her gender dysphoria during testimony on a bill aimed at preventing the state from removing children in situations similar to the Cox families, Mary Cox expressed her disagreement with her daughter's diagnosis of gender dysphoria. The Indiana Court of Appeals emphasized that while parents have the freedom to practice their religious beliefs, they cannot harm their children emotionally or physically. Though the Cox appeal is rejected by both the U.S. and Indiana Supreme Court, the Coxes maintain their stance referring to their child is as, quote, our son. They vow to continue their fight. I'm going to say this and I'm going to say it proudly. Fuck those cocks. Like, how <laughs> fucking dare you be so engulfed in your religion that you disregard the feelings of your child, this person that you gave yeah. birth to. They're trying to be their truest self with you along this journey. They're trying to take you along with them. As queer people, a lot of us can relate to situations where as we discover who we really are, we sort of distance ourselves from our parents because we feel like they won't understand. This child is trying to undergo this with your support, Cox, and you're doing a shitty job. Like literally they just want your support, uh, your, your guidance, 
And because based off your religion, your religion is telling you that you cannot support your child being who they truly are. And maybe that religion is a piece of shit and you shouldn't follow it. Well, and, and that's bull in and of itself. To use the fact that we are you know, devoutly Christian as any kind of reason why we do not love our child is about the most unchristian thing I think that I have ever heard. Mm -hmm. uh, Jesus was all about helping other people and being there for them and listening to them and working with the people who were normally cast out from society. Well, your daughter falls into that category. And I'm sorry to say she probably would have been better off raised by wolves. Oh, yeah. cool. Aside from you, bees. I, aside from you, cocks. <laughs> um, so I, I am... I separate the, the, the two different ideas. One is taking a child away from parents that are, are, that have a different belief system. I think that it should definitely be an individually looked at case by a social worker. Um, just because they have different viewpoints on what, on what maybe if transgenderism or queer is right or wrong. I don't think that you should take a child out of the home because of that. But this social worker deemed that it was abusive it had crossed a line to the point where this child has an eating disorder um it's the the social worker mandated therapy and i don't think that they agreed to the therapy because they were just staunchly in their religion so in this case i do believe that they should be taken away and every case should be looked at differently it's a really polarizing um subject and I think there are many people, many parents that hear their child say, I think I might be trans, I might be gay, I might what, whatever. And if they express some kind of hesitation because they don't know, you know, they need to work through it and just make sure that we're not making those snap decisions. But in this case, for sure, this child needs to be away from their parents. And they don't realize the damage that they're doing, you know, to this <clears throat> this child. You know, I, I speak from own experience. You know, when I was growing up, you know, it was very hard for me to come out as a young person because there wasn't a lot of role models within my own family. And it went against a lot of the beliefs of my family. So um, it made a lot of uh, turbulent things. And I identify with eating disorders because I've had weight issues my my entire life as well. So, you know, I, I feel for that. And, you know, I just hope that, you know, that with the with the good support systems that are out there that, you know, she'll find her her ways. Yeah. And I believe that you didn't have a lot of gay uh, role models because there weren't a lot of gay cavemen when you were a child. So. Yeah, no, there who, weren't. Who could you look up to? We're getting, cave to the, we're getting to the aging gracefully. <laughs> <laughs> Coming. Says who? All right, Edward. All right. Well, let's queer up the USA view. New survey shows censorship efforts at libraries are soaring. According to a recent report by the American Library Association, last year book bans and attempts on book bans spiked in the U.S., reaching record levels. The ALA revealed that 4,240 books in schools and public libraries were targeted in 2023, a significant increase from the previous record of 2,571 books in 2022, marking the highest number recorded by the association in over two decades. Notably, 47% of the challenged books centered on LGBTQ plus and radical themes. While the total number of individual challenges decreased slightly to 1,247, efforts to censor numerous books con concurrently surged the highest in Florida and Texas, driven by conservative groups like Moms for Liberty and websites such as booklooks.org and ratedbooks.org. Deborah Caldwell Stone, director of ALA's Office for Intellectual Freedom, emphasized that every attempt to ban a book undermines the fundamental right to choose and access diverse literature, hindering the voices of marginalized communities. She expressed particular concern over the escalating challenges in public libraries, which now account for 40% of all recorded incidents, a significant increase from the previous year. In the incoming month, the ALA will reveal its annual compilation of the most frequently challenged books. Maya Kobabi's graphic memoir, Gender Queer, has held the top spot for two consecutive years, accompanied by other controversial titles such as Jonathan Evison's Lawn Boy, Sherman Alexie's 
the absolutely true diary of a part-time Indian, and Nobel Lorette's Toni Morrison's The Bluest Eye. Well, book banning. <laughs> I mean, that's not new, is it? Mm -mm. You know, that's been going on since the day of time. But, you know, I mean, I'm not surprised in our current state, you know, what we're going through in terms of all this. I just keep hearing about, you know, everything that's being taken away, you know, from uh, from the young people getting to learn about, you know, the LGBTQ plus and other cultures, you know, and this is just their attempt to just stop that. You well, know? And when has the suppression of an idea ever worked to eliminate that idea? The suppression, you know, that, that kind of active suppression just brings more attention to it. Mm -hmm. Exactly. When I was, I don't know, probably like 11, 12, realizing that I was gay, library was like the first place that I went. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, I couldn't find like any real sort of queer books, but getting rid of those books is not going to change anything. No. All I needed was one men's fitness magazine or <laughs> one, right. one Sears catalog back in our day to uh, get that confirmation. Those pages of, were sticky, huh? Mm. <laughs> Oh dear Lord! But they're not even watches this. They're not even really. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, I was just say it's it's it it's it's a hideous thing to do in terms of restricting freedoms, but it's also just not going to work and accomplish the end that they want. Yeah, they're not talking about high school or public school uh, libraries. They're talking about just regular libraries. Right. How how we can even go along with this? And it's so anti Republican. Which is the weird thing is that exactly. it's about personal freedoms and rights, which is what they're constantly harping on mm -hmm. and like how they can square that away with, uh, you know, allowing us as adults to be able to read books like it's the most insane thing that I've ever heard. And none of this will stand mm -hmm. just like all of the uh, laws that they're trying to architect in, a, in a, an effort to subvert gay and lesbian people and trans people. It keeps blowing up in their face because it's blatantly unconstitutional. Right. So all you're doing, as Mark is saying, is you're just putting it out there for all of us to read and to make sure that every Talk about kid here. with a rebellious streak in them is going to start reading exactly. it. So thank you. Exactly. Because I just learned how to read and I'm very interested in these books now. <laughs> Like, I wasn't even going to read these shits before. I was going to stay on my phone. But now I want to read some books. Well, we can uh, tell. Wig is all up in my square. Oh, my God. Good. It deserves <laughs> okay. it. Okay. Oh. <laughs> Don't throw shade if you can't get them. <laughs> all right. Next, let's queer up trans rights. What is Transgender Day of Visibility and why is it important? Transgender Day of Visibility celebrated annually on March 31st is a day dedicated to recognizing and celebrating transgender and gender non-conforming individuals around the world. It's a time to raise awareness of the discrimination and challenges faced by transgender people while also celebrating their accomplishments and contributions to society. This day holds importance, especially amidst the ongoing socio-political environment of the country, as it serves as a platform to amplify transgender voices and advocate for equal rights and acceptance. We at Queer News Tonight will be celebrating Transgender Day of Visibility as part of our efforts to challenge stereotypes and foster understanding and acceptance within communities. Transgender individuals often face discrimination, violence, and marginalization simply for being who they are. Transgender Day of Visibility aims to combat this stigma by promoting education, awareness, and advocacy for transgender rights. South Florida will be hosting multiple events on this day to celebrate trans culture and life. SunServe and AIDS Healthcare Foundation will be hosting Let's Have a Kiki, a celebration of Transgender Day of Visibility on March 31st. It's a reminder to acknowledge the struggles and triumphs of transgender individuals, to show support and solidarity, and to work towards creating a more inclusive and equitable society for all, especially for trans youth, like Nex Benedict, whom we lost recently. Queer News Tonight, in support of our 11 pillars of our nonprofit mission, did more than 300 stories over and about the trans community and their important place in our LGBTQ plus community. And it will continue despite the attacks we see all around the world. So I'm going to tell you just a tiny little story back in maybe 2000, 2001. Um, there was this call on, on Broadway for the first uh, all Indian cast doing uh, Bombay Dreams, and they 
I got selected yeah. for this casting. I ended up going to New York, reading through the script and everything. And the, I, at that time in Homestead, I was a Southern Baptist. Ooh. I had to keep one foot on the floor. We couldn't like move too much. Uh, so I was very much entrenched in religion. And I remember reading through the script and seeing the Hydras, um, which was like this this transgender. I didn't even really know the term transgender at that time. It wasn't so popular, but looked like what we would call transgender today um, in the script. And I used to think, man, Broadway just has to make everything gay, you know? And so as I decided when I went home uh, that I was going to read more up on the Hijras, which was the, the transgendered people of the Indian community. And I thought, wow, they actually have a place but I've never seen this on television. I've never seen this portrayed in movies. I decided I'm gonna start researching a little bit more when it comes to uh, uh, other cultures, Native American cultures, mm -hmm. the Ottoman Empire. And I was shocked that they were all there. Mm -hmm. They were always there. And somehow, even in the most barbaric societies, they found a place for them. Wow. Like everybody recognized who they were. Sometimes they, in the Ottoman Empire, they were kind of like, the pageant coaches of the women who were in the harem. Yeah. And they were the only people, the only, I guess, what they would call men that were allowed to be in the harems with mm -hmm. them to kind of coach them. And I'm like, they didn't just kill them? Wow, they didn't just, you know, I'm thinking that how we were raised in the history that we r read, it would seem that they would be just complete outcasts of society, when in reality, they were always integrated. They were and, weird at times. Yeah, and we never learned about it. We never saw it. We don't see depictions of it on mainstream uh, television or in movies. And so that's why it's so important for this trans day of visibility to show that they were always here. Yeah. They were always part of our Absolutely. community. And to get rid of that feeling of like, if you don't, if something is new to you, there's always that feeling of like, do I kill it or do I love it or do I accept it? You know, if we all knew that they were there from the beginning, that feeling of immediate hate of like, stamp this out, wouldn't be there anymore. I was so fortunate. Uh, when I was working in New York uh, for J.P. Morgan about 20 something years ago, and um, we had, uh, I was exposed to my very first transgender woman um, then. And it was so progressive for J.P. Morgan, a financial firm, to hire somebody as a vice president, as a transgender person. And so I, I immediately, you know, I was part of the LGBTQ plus network for J.P. Morgan. And so it was so wonderful in getting interest, interested in getting to know this person and their journey and just knowing that they're still successful today, oh. just as part of that journey. I, I mean, like, I see it like 20 years ago and even today it's just still like it's so important to keep that visibility and it's so great that they have such a uh, that we have a day just to you know give them support so yeah. and I, I think we need to be careful also about always kind of pointing the finger at the other people who have an issue with trans when we do have our own issues right within our own little lgbtq plus mm -hmm. rainbow and i'm just going to say i think that gay men probably have the biggest issue where we still have spaces yeah. um, in social areas, in dating areas, in hookup areas, also where you know trans people are, are explicitly not welcome. I got an invitation to join a uh, a social group mm -hmm. through Meetup that the first two or three paragraphs of it just bashed feminine men, trans men, you know, that we don't want any of that. So, you know, come here if you're kind of yeah, yeah, yeah. this whole sort of mask for mask. Mm -hmm. You know, we do a lot of talking on the news, I think, about the straight community, the legal community, all of that. But yeah. really that on that day, we also need to put a mirror up against uh, ourselves yeah. sure. and the kind of communities that we create. And it, it has a lot to do with our own misogyny and yeah. the, the gay male community. So I, as a drag queen and cisgender man, um, I've I've gotten a lot of, <laughs> of of goodies from the trans community. I've gotten bookies, uh, bookings. I've had nice conversations. I've had uh, nice hugs when I needed it. I've had um, just opportunities to learn from them. And I don't make it a point to meet a trans person and have them explain the trans uh, experience to me because that's not their responsibility. And they can only speak on what they've experienced themselves and what they've seen immediately around them. But I do appreciate getting to know them, befriending a lot of them, having a lot of their like numbers in my phone. Um, I have a, a friend, Ground Zero. He is a local drag king performer. Um, he does fire stunts, stilts and everything. Ground King, I love you. But just to be in close proximity with, with great talents and just great, amazing people 
who just so happen to have the trans experience. Like, we appreciate you. We love you. We want to continue, start and continue to create spaces where you feel not only safe, but valued. Mm. Because the trans experience has always been there since day one. But the trans hatred has been more recent in relation to like how long time is whatever. But we just appreciate you, trans community. We love you and you will always be safe and appreciated in our eyes and our arms. So thank you so much. Mm. Next, let's queer up gay culture. Shining through time, here are the stunning portraits of the old gays. Queer News Tonight has done countless stories on the old gays. They embody our pillar supporting LGBTQ plus seniors. The old gays continue to shine in a stunning new collection of portraits by photographer Maxwell Poth. Through his black and white lens, Poth shows the joy and beauty of aging gracefully while capturing Michael Peterson, Billy Lyons, Jesse L. Martin, and Robert E. Reeves. Their images, juxtaposed with photos of their younger selves, serve as a powerful reminder of the blessings of growing older. As former Out 100 cover stars and social media personalities, the old gays inspire us to celebrate queer elders and appreciate the journey of life. Poth's portraits beautifully showcase their resilience, vitality, and enduring spirit for all to see. Poth informed that he took these photographs last April while working on a project with these handsome gays. He shared the experience of working with them, saying, quote, I loved every second of getting to know them and hearing their stories. You are loved, end quote. Here's a sneak peek into Maxwell Poth's breathtaking portraits of the old gays. For more of Maxwell's work, you can follow him on Instagram at Maxwell Poth. I love that I got this story, and hopefully not just because I'm more than like I think it's appropriate for you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And it, was, it was funny. As soon as I got it, I, you know, I sync my phone every single time I get a new one. So, like, my pictures go back to the grainy days Ooh. of pictures. <laughs> I'm I, right there with you. I pulled up something like probably 15 years ago just to look at, like, the before and, and, and after. And I'm sorry. I am much better now. You look at those pictures of me at that age, and you can tell what I was doing every weekend. You can see the stress on my face. Yeah. You can, I think you really see a much happier person. And yeah, there's going to be some wrinkles and some spots, but um, the smile is so much more real and genuine. I'm one of those people who genuinely enjoys getting old and love when people get my age wrong and love somebody trying to throw an age uh, jab at me too. Who would do that? Mm. <laughs> I, I'm loving everybody before these cameras turned on. <laughs> you were at home. Uh, people on the street. <laughs> I have to tell you. Anyone that. with good vision. Yeah. <laughs> I do agree with you because, you know, I'm at that age now. I'm in my mid 50s and, you know, it feels, you know, like uh, it's a different world for me. You know, I, I kind of don't really care so much about what other people are thinking about me anymore and what other people are saying. I'm just kind of living my life. I'm living my best life and you know here i am on happening out you know queer news tonight you know i mean this is fantastic so you know you can do anything at any age and it's just so inspiring you know just to to see these old gays i, I follow them on on, on instagram yeah. and stuff they're a riot you know i mean i'm like this is so inspiring because you could do anything at any age yeah you know? we'll just give you one old man lesson what other people think of you is none of your business right that takes a, that takes a while to sink in but when it does oh my god life is so much freer I will say, I, I I feel, if I look back at my old pictures that are synced up with, you know, your Facebook memories and stuff, I definitely like me more now in my mid-40s than I did yeah. in, in my mid-20s. And I actually think that I look better because I learned how to take care of myself more, uh, which huh? then I was just living on a prayer <laughs> and ramen noodles, you know what I mean? Ooh, no, so, <laughs> not Bon Jovi. So, I, yeah. so I, I love that part of it. I have... I have such reverence for people who went through the AIDS crisis mm. in the 80s and the 90s because so many people were killed and there's so mu much of a trauma in that generation. Yeah. So even I, I have this respect thing, like even when I disagree vehemently with somebody who went through that, like I just always like kind of hold back a little bit and I'm like you went through some shit that I will never understand what that was like yeah, let me listen to have the <laughs> right. entire world like just forget about you while you're rotting away in in a hospital bed and uh, probably not even open for visitors to come in and for doctors to reject you and like the amount of vigils that they went to um it's it's a really horrific time in our history and I will never forget all the people that survived that and the trauma that went through that 
on a superficial note, <laughs> yeah, on a right. superficial note, I'm so glad that plastic surgery has <laughs> evolved the way. So I do hope that in my 70s and 80s, I will look very <laughs> not not much different at all from my before pictures. Thanks, so, Trini, thank for you. not reading the story right. at all that we're covering. <laughs> it's the opposite. <laughs> Your cheeks will be out there. Yeah. <laughs> so I will say as a youth, um, the gay community has a very interesting uh, relationship with age. So I always say that I just turned 30, which is like the gay 18 years old. Shut the fuck up. So <laughs> because when we're in grade school, we're not allowed to be our truest, most authentic self. Fix your bangs. We are not allowed to be our most truest and authentic self, right? We have to be the closet version. So when we do typically approach our 20s and we decide to, I'm going to figure out who I really am, be my truest self. It's like we're like 13 years old again. Mm -hmm. So by the time we get 30, we're like, okay, I went through my prepubescent stage in my 20s. Now it's time to be an adult, like a young adult at my 30s. But then on the other side of it, we are shamed for looking any sort of age older than like 30. It, like if you look your age, it's a problem. If you age gracefully, it's a problem. Unless, <laughs> unless you die at 18, then like you're just like some old withered not my sentiment i love you guys but <laughs> you're just some like old withered like bag of sand and i think we really need to readjust our relationship with age as the queer community uh we want to get old right that's that's the goal is better than the alternative <laughs> we knew a lot of gays in the 80s like you just said in the 90s who didn't have the privilege and the honor of like growing old because they died from a disease that was uh that grew from the neglect from the government so getting older is the goal we can do what we can to treat it and make sure our skin is healthy and tight and use as much duct tape as we can trust me i got a lot on right now but let's let's appreciate and let's let's look forward to growing and aging together because the goal is to be here as long as we can because if we die out the republicans win and they can go fuck themselves next let's queer up entertainment <laughs> Will and Grace star Eric McCormick weighs in on straight actors playing gay roles. Eric McCormick, famed for his role as Will Truman on Will and Grace, weighs in on the debate about straight actors playing gay characters. Speaking on ITV's Good Morning Britain, McCormick acknowledges the complexity of the issue, noting that acting inherently involves portraying someone different from oneself. He argues against limiting roles based on an actor's sexual orientation emphasizing the importance of actors' ability to embody diverse characters. McCormick's perspective reflects his belief in the inclusivity of the acting profession and its capacity to transcend boundaries. He wittily adds that if gay actors were restricted from playing straight roles, Broadway would suffer the consequences. McCormick hopes that he represents the LGBTQ plus community well. He shared that his background in theater and close friendship with a gay man influenced his portrayal. He emphasized casting based on merit, believing the most talented actor should secure the role. In Will and Grace, McCormick and Sean Hayes portrayed the main gay characters. Hayes, who was not openly gay then, played Jack McFarlane. Hayes earned seven Emmy nominations, winning once, while McCormick received four nominations, winning in 2001. Now, first and foremost, Eric, didn't know you were straight. Happy to learn that. Congratulations. Uh, <laughs> Secondly, um, <laughs> they're so cute at that age. I, I agree with his perspective, but my perspective comes from, uh, funny enough, the, the Twitter porn community. My perspective has always been, I don't care if you're gay baiting as long as you're good at it. So as long as you turn the person on in the gay porn, whether you're queer or not, like just do a good job, put on a performance. And I think that relates to being a, a straight actor playing queer roles. As long as we live in a community where queer actors can be casted for straight roles. It has to work both ways. Exactly. I can't. I, go ahead. I was gonna say I can't believe I'm agreeing with Bonnie on Girl, this. Girl, you, you got to be right sometimes. I, I mean, from a slightly different perspective, because mm -hmm. to me, when I see somebody like Eric McCormick playing a gay character, it almost kind of forces me to get all the way into the character, because it's not. It, deep, it is deep inside. It, mm, deep and gun oil. <laughs> deep yeah. to that. Mm. Gun Rose oil. Blood, go ahead. Oh dear lord. <laughs> Um, I and I think sometimes when you see gay characters playing uh, or, or gay actors playing gay characters, you're wondering, well, how much of that is them um, is really them? And I'm kind of caught in the who are you versus who is the character. So not only do I not mind it, I like it being switched up like that as, as an audience member. It allows me to relax into the role and trust the actor. Yeah, yeah I, I, I I'm always thinking about, you know, when uh, 
I used to watch Will and Grace, you know, when it was first airing and stuff. And I was always, I always knew Sean Hayes was gay, you know. We all did. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, and there was nothing ever said about it. And I was, I was always kind of felt let down. And, you know, and as much as I appreciated, uh, you know, the, um, Eric doing the Will part, um, you know, I always didn't feel connected with him that way. So it was always a struggle for me. But, you know, in this day and age, yeah, it should really just go on merit for the most part, I would think. You know, I mean, we're, I think we're at a point now where there's enough gay actors that are out that can basically do any role. So, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. th that's how, you know, when you grew up in the theater, that was, we didn't have a lot of gay roles and we didn't have a lot of gay role models. So. Well, I have a theater company, so I Ooh, deal with okay. casting. I just casted Grease, which I'll be doing some Yay. more queer news stuff about later on. Um, yeah, I think a lot of times when we're talking about diversity and equity, inclusion, all of that stuff, we're talking about a space that doesn't have that population, that demographic in it. The theater and uh, television acting has plenty of gay people in it, mm -hmm. right? So I think that it's more important if the story is, you know, take a Brokeback Mountain or something like that. I will. Like, I okay. Will. <laughs> yeah, like, I think the acting really is the most important part of it and how it fits. And I actually love seeing straight people. I think it should be fair, you know, mm. give them the shot just as you would a straight actor. But I do think that there's a lot of power when straight men show that it's okay to be gay Dang and they do God. a whole lot of press about it and they're constantly being asked are you gay are you gay and they're like no but if i was there'd be nothing wrong with that and when you take somebody who's considered like kind of a a, a portrait of masculinity and they kind of flip the script um i think it's incredibly powerful for all the people who are anti-gay john cena is probably one of my biggest crushes yeah. because he is a guy who has never strayed away from gay stereotypes. Mm. He's even kissed a dude, like in the, if you've ever seen the seven seconds in an mm. interview or something. Yeah. And he's like, guys, what is the big deal about all of this? Like, right. this is just stupid, like toxic masculinity. And I can beat your ass. So, um, he can. like, <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so like when you have true, guys bro. like that that are actively yeah. like repping for the gay community, I think it's better for all of us too. So, yeah, straight guys, you can play gay roles in my opinion. Yeah, bro, you got it. <laughs> uh, next, we are proud of our special partnership with Sunshine Cathedral, the world's largest queer church here in Fort Lauderdale. Mm. Supporting that partnership, we are broadcasting from our permanent set here at the Sunshine Cathedral at the Happening Out Television Studios. We broadcast Sunshine Cathedral Sunday international service at 10.30 a.m. We finish tonight's queer news headlines with a segment we call LGBTQ Plus One Minute News. LGBTQ Plus One Minute News. Let's queer up entertainment. <clears throat> Trans American Idol contestant wins judges' hearts. Amari, a 28-year-old waitress from Indiana, wowed American Idol judges with Sarah Bellis's She Used to Be Mine. Her emotional performance and backstory, including her journey as a transgender woman, moved the audience. Despite a shaky start with Britney Spears' Toxic, Katy Perry urged Amari to sing another song. Amari then opened up 
about her transition journey, expressing acceptance despite losing some people along the way. The judges praised her resilience and authenticity. When she sang a song from Borellis' musical Waitress, her talent left a lasting impression on Perry and Richie, both giving her a yes. Amari's presence on the iconic talent show stage highlighted the power of self-expression and acceptance. LGBTQ plus one minute news, let's queer up entertainment. Michelle Visage offers heartfelt advice at GLAAD Media Awards. At the 35th GLAAD Media Awards, RuPaul's Drag Race star Michelle Visage shared her experience parenting a queer child. Encouraging parents to embrace their children's identity, she expressed pride in her child's journey. Quote, I have a queer child who is basically transitioning, and for me, it was a matter of allowing yourself grace to realize this is not the child you thought you were getting, and it's an even better child, end quote. How beautiful. Visage, set to host RuPaul's Drag Race Down Under, spoke passionately about the LGBTQ plus community's significance, affirming her commitment to advocacy. The event also celebrated achievements in media with Renee Rapp, Oprah Winfrey, and Baldur Gate Three among the honorees. It's an honor, not only to do it globally, but to be part of the legacy that, that Drag Race is and has to offer to be able to help be an even small part of changing queer artists' lives for the better and showcasing them. I have a queer child who's basically transitioning. And for me, it was a matter of uh, allowing yourself grace to realize this is not the child that you thought you were getting. Mm -hmm. And it's an even better child because they're authentically themselves. They're not living a lie. And all they really need is love. We, they didn't ask to be born the way that they were born. It just happened that way. Give yourself grace, give yourself time and patience, and just love your kid, and it'll magically cure everything. LGBTQ plus one minute news. Let's queer up gay culture. Dua Lipa's life is way more fun with the gays. Hey. Grammy award winner Dua Lipa shared her LGBTQ plus allyship in a chat with Trixie Mattel. The Grammy-winning artist has consistently supported the LGBTQ plus community. She fearlessly condemned Qatar's human rights record before the 2022 FIFA World Cup and publicly denounced the baby for his homophobic remarks. Dua Lipa was interviewed ahead of her album, Radical Optimism, where she discussed her friendship with Troy Sivan and support for queer fans. Mattel asked when Lipa realized she'd always been surrounded by gay men. Lipa's response reflected her genuine love for the community. She said, quote, I just love it. There was no accepting. I was in it. Life is way more fun with the gays. I just love it. I, there was no like accepting. I was just in, I was in it. In it. I don't know. You were way one with the fun. gays. Life is way more fun with the gays. I'm not going to lie. I don't want to get confident. Mine looks really good so far. <laughs> LGBTQ plus one minute news, let's queer up entertainment. Should we expect queer actors to be cast as James Bond? The search for the next James Bond may end with Aaron Taylor Johnson, but calls persist for LGBTQ plus representation in the iconic role. Despite tradition favoring straight white men, the franchise could embrace diversity. Daniel Craig's tenure as Bond concludes leaving room for a fresh perspective. While Taylor Johnson fits the mold, queer Bond fans want to see LGBTQ plus actors playing the role. So in case Taylor Johnson turns the role down, we have a list of our favorite queer actors who would be perfect to play James Bond. The list includes Elliot Page, Andrew Scott, Jonathan Bailey, Nakuti Gatwa, Richard Armitage, Coleman Domingo, Luke Evans, India Moore, Kristen Stewart, Matt Bomer, Tess Thompson, Sayan Servan and Billy Porter. <clears throat> LGBTQ plus one minute news. Let's queer up gay culture. Reddit discussion proves that TSA discovering sex, to sex toys in carry-ons is not that unusual. You might have come across the viral video of a TSA agent knowingly looking after discovering a sex toy in a traveler's carry-on. Similarly, a TSA agent left a note for a passenger who had a vibrator in their bag saying, get your freak on. 
<laughs> Midas. Girl. girl don't forget the girl. Yeah, you can't forget the girl. Oh, I'm sorry. Get your freak on, girl. All right. <laughs> <laughs> These incidents highlight how private items sometimes become public knowledge during travel. Reddit users shared their embarrassing antidotes in a recent subreddit asking gay bros thread. The original post asked, anyone ever have TSA find your sex toys? And the comments started pouring in. The list of such incidents is long as if you were searched for the original post online. We assure you a great laugh. Meanwhile, here are a few comments. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. That's today's news for the LGBTQ plus community on the world's first and only daily LGBTQ plus evening news show. If our community is important to you, share this news with your friends and family. Are you, like most of America, part of a very large television audience watching this LGBTQ plus live news broadcast right now on Roku, Apple TV, Android TV, and Amazon Fire TV? Tonight is the only live LGBTQ plus digital television show in the world that is out of the closet and into the headlines. We need your support. If our community is to grow, we must tell our stories and bring them to the attention of the broader world. This is the only place in the world that tells these types of LGBTQ plus stories in motion and sound. That's the passion of Hotspots Magazine, Happening Out Television Network and Queer News Tonight. I'm your anchor, Bonnie Builder. And on behalf of these LGBTQ plus reporters, the anchors of Queer News Tonight, including Trinidadi, Edward Otto Zilke, and Mark Pettit, we will see you daily at 8 p.m. To our LGBTQ plus world, we wish you good night. Good night. Good night.